with all of you this morning. It really is. I don't know if this is planned in a staff meeting or what, but I have heard so many organic comments from all of you about how wonderful the Lord's work is among you these days here at Creekside. Um, it's incredible. It's not coming from the staff. It's coming from all of you. There seems to be a, a spirit-driven liveliness in this congregation, um, and hearing that is a, is a deep source of, source of joy for me personally. just want to make two comments on the front end. Uh, number one, it has been 10 years since Creekside um, invested so generously into the life of City Church in downtown. Uh, and that investment continues these days. The staff, the pastors, all of you continue to minister to my family in very rich ways. Uh, and one of the things that stands out to me, uh, uh, some of you might not be aware of this, but my, my dad passed away 10 years ago. Uh, this past Friday, actually, it was 10 years on, on the dot. And I was right up here when I found out that he passed away. It's actually in the middle of teaching at a Sunday night service when I got a call from my mom, and then I went and got that call. And so this church family has ministered to me, richly ministered to my wife and to my kids for the past decade now. Um, and we just love you so much, more than you can possibly know. And I mean that very genuinely. We have discontentment on our minds this morning, a subject that I chose mainly because the Lord has been putting it on my mind a lot recently. Even in the past few days, I've been thinking about what does it look like to be content uh, when you're grieving, when you're hurting? What does that look like? What does contentment mean in that kind of environment? Discontentment gets more, it gets more expensive with age when you're two. When you're two, it's something like, you know, well, if I only had that that balloon over there, then I would be content. And then when you're 40, it's like, well, if I only had that BMW that my neighbor has. So at one point in your life, you needed about 85 cents to supposedly quell your discontentment. Now you need (laughs) $85,000. Discontentment also gets more entrenched with age. And I would say destructive as well. There's this kind of bitter hardening that occurs over time that ends up trapping us in these prisons of self-interest. And then in our discontentment, we might move frenetically from job to job, never feeling entirely satisfied, always searching for our true calling. Or in our discontentment, we might become servants of our leisure, taking that trip of a lifetime for the 50th time as the length of our bucket list starts to rival the length of Old Testament genealogies, <laughs> or in our discontentment, we might even switch spouses, looking for someone to be that soulmate we deserve rather than trying to be that person for whoever it is that we originally married. Conversely, contentment is far less expensive, it's far more constructive, and frankly, it's far more compelling. Check out these journal entries from the surgeon and Methodist preacher Richard Williams while he and his missionary team were simultaneously starving to death and freezing to death as they waited on a delayed supply ship. This entry was from Good Friday, April 18th, 1851. Poor and weak though we are, our abode is a very Bethel to our souls. And God we feel and know is here. And then on Wednesday, May 7th, he wrote, Should anything prevent me from ever adding to this, that all my beloved ones at home rest assured that I was happy beyond description when I wrote these lines and would not have changed situations with any man living. And then shortly after these entries, everybody on his team died of starvation and exposure because the ship was too late. Listen, people who stay at all-inclusive resorts in the Caribbean don't even talk like this, right? (laughs) I mean, maybe they'll give you like a a five-star, a a positive review on Google, but they're not saying, they're not saying I was happy beyond description and wouldn't have changed places with any man living. And yet here was Richard Williams leaving exactly this kind of review for Tierra del Fuego (laughs) while his very life was getting snuffed out by the elements. That's a bit compelling, isn't it? That's interesting. 
far more so than the estate of the person who's, who's constantly flailing around for happiness and meaning always giving fairly negative and cynical reports despite the appearance of having quite a lot of wonderful earthly things going for them. And goodness, if you are sitting here this morning in the throes of discontentment, this story, even from Richard Williams, should give you a lot of hope. As it turns out, true contentment is not contingent on changes to our circumstances, which are outside of our control. We're not playing the, the contentment lottery. So if we're experiencing a season of discontentment, and honestly all of us do at one point or another, how do we get the kind of contentment that Richard Williams experienced, that the psalmist, evidently David here, experienced? This morning we're going to look at two options, two competing options for dealing with discontentment, two strategies. Number one, running, and number two, reminding. Running, and reminding. Let's get started with that first option, running. Before we talk more about running and get a touch negative, at least for a little while, notice the foreshadowing in verse 1 concerning the posture of a content person, which includes language that's prominent in many other psalms as well. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. The people of God realize that finding refuge will be a necessary part of life on earth, and they look for that refuge in God alone. They realize that trying to completely avoid trials and suffering is a fool's errand, so the wiser plan is to find a shelter that will bear the weight of the storms. Case in point, King David here doesn't seem to have, as far as we can tell, a, a specific threat in mind in this psalm as he appeals to the Lord for refuge. David simply knows that a pop-up storm is possible at any time. And he knows that they're a matter of when, not if which reminds us of something very important about shelters. They don't keep the storms from coming. They provide protection in the midst of the storms. David and the Apostle Paul, and we could go on and on, they really didn't spend much time asking God for no storms. They asked God for protection and deliverance and joy because they knew that sin makes the world Stormy. They knew they lived in Florida, <laughs> so they asked for a roof over their heads. I'm jumping the gun just a little bit here, but I'm going to say this now, and I'll kind of circle back to it in a little bit. So many Christians are discontent because they don't know where they live. They are residents of Florida in the summer, but their minds are in Southern California, where I grew up. So their expectations are, they're way off. Of course it's going to rain. Of course walking your dog is going to end up feeling like putting your clothes on right after you took a shower. That's where we live. Misplaced expectations lie at the root of a lot of discontentment. But why... Does the psalmist specifically turn to God for this refuge? Verse 2, because the psalmist acknowledges that the Lord is my Lord. I have no good apart from you. God can provide refuge for his people because he is not simply the Lord. You see how personal this is? He is, he is their Lord a claim confidently made by those who put their trust and hope in him. And as our Lord, he is all-powerful, and he is so good that nothing better exists. Yes. Powerful goodness is the essence of refuge 
And that's what you have in God. The character Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia series depicts this combination remarkably well. So do faithful parents, which explains why children tend to stay close by them in a crowd. If a threat emerges, the children want to be near their parents because they are powerful, at least comparatively, and they're good and they can therefore provide refuge. Now let's look at verses 3 and 4, which will finally bring us to the, to the running option that I promised we'd get to. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. One of the marks of genuine faith and trust in God for refuge is genuine delight in like-minded people, a unique camaraderie that manifests itself in a desire to spend time with and to encourage one another. And of course, this isn't merely delightful. It's quite necessary if we are going to faithfully make our way through storms. God designed spiritual community in part to help us endure. For David, these saints that he's talking about here would have been fellow Israelites whose lives indicated that they had genuinely set themselves before the Lord in faith. For us today, the saints would be fellow believers who are bearing fruit in keeping with genuine repentance and trust in the Lord. And then the accompanying mark of genuine faith and trust in God for refuge is this. Steadfastly refusing to participate in the practices of discontented people who are running after another God. When we experience discontentment, we will be tempted to run after a God other than the one true God. For the Israelites, this most likely meant worshiping pagan deities including here the associated, check this out, practices of blood sacrifices and even putting the blood, sometimes substituted with wine, to their lips as a drink. I'm not particularly concerned about those specific practices for any of you. If I should be, let me know after the service. But here's what I am concerned about. I am concerned about things like money. I'm concerned about things like sex. I am concerned about things like power, to give three prominent examples, none of which are inherently bad. Power is an interesting discussion that we don't have time to get into right now. But they end up being really unfortunate and destructive gods. They promise so much often a kind of instantaneous antidote for discontentment. But then instead of controlling them, they end up controlling us because they become our gods. And then, as you've probably heard before, over time, they demand more and more, and they provide less and less, and we end up using and abusing others instead of serving them, and so our sorrows multiply. Isn't it so haunting that we will be tempted to run, not walk, after these things? To hasten our way to them, even with enthusiasm and joy. That is the power of discontentment. So let's not think for a moment that we're beyond its tragic outcomes. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, maybe my life verse, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. One of the ways to guard ourselves against this running is to learn how to detect discontentment, which can and often does lie beneath the surface and therefore make us especially vulnerable to running headlong after false gods. Awareness issues are our breeding grounds for, metaphorically speaking, spiritual racing hounds who end up sprinting after these rabbits that are both fake and always 
slightly out of reach. Here are some classic signs of discontentment, which is always spiritual in nature. Classic signs of discontentment. Number one, intentional changes to your external circumstances, new job, new romantic interest, new place to live, etc., consistently fail to meet your expectations. Number two, you find yourself regularly thinking or making statements such as, if only I had fill in the blank, then I would be happy. Number three, excessive self-focus. For example, you're always in your own head. Perhaps you're always thinking about how you're feeling. Or maybe you dominate conversations, often with personal anecdotes rather than listening well. Number four, inability or maybe just refusal to rest. For example, you are constantly busy and you're talking about how busy you are. Or even when you are resting, you're really just kind of resting. You know, you're, you're on your phone, you're tinkering around with things. And then speaking of phones, number five, I think that heavy smartphone and media use are telltale signs of discontentment in our day. We are literally scrolling or searching for a sense of meaning or significance or pleasure. So my exhortation as the guest here <laughs> would be to sort through these signs to see if you get any hits because we cannot deal with the problem that we're unaware of. And I'd guess that more of us than we realize are actually dealing right now with some discontentment which means that more of us than we might realize are in danger of running after false gods, or we might be doing, here's the scary thing, we might be doing exactly that even while maintaining a Christian veneer. And let's remember where we live. We live in a world that remains beautiful in so many ways, and yet is filled with so much trouble with so many storms. And it will remain that way until Jesus returns and consummates his ongoing mission to make all things new and bring his people into the new and glorious city, Jerusalem. We cannot expect heaven on earth until Jesus brings it. And if we do, we are setting ourselves up to tarnish the beauty of that is here right now by expecting too much from it. And we're in for a world of disappointment and discontentment. Now, somewhat ironically, I suppose, I hope this has made all of you very discontent <laughs> with spiritual discontentment and the aforementioned ways of running after it. That kind of discontentment is holy, and it pivots us toward the second option for dealing with discontentment, which is reminding. So first, running, and now the far, far better option, reminding. With me at verses 5 and 6. The Lord is my chosen portion of my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. These stanzas lie at the heart of Psalm 16. And actually, to understand their beauty, we need to recall, <laughs> we need to recall the land apportionments that the Lord ordained following Israel's conquest of Canaan. You can read all about this in the book of Joshua, chapters 13 through 21. Those are the chapters where we always, if we're doing one of those reads through the Bible plans, we wonder if we can kind of skip that and it still counts. But I would encourage you not to, and we'll see why in a minute. You can read all about this, these land apportionments in the book of Joshua, chapters 13 through 21, and there you will find that the Lord assigned, I mean, very specific lots of land to the tribes of Israel as their inheritance. 
You might find these passages, you know, dry and technical and long. I mean, it's like, and then the boundary passed through so and such, and then so and such, and then now here are all the cities included in these boundaries that we've just laid out. But these details, let me tell you what, would have been quite fascinating and relevant to those actually receiving the allotments, as well as to their descendants. This is good reading right here, if you're getting this stuff. (laughs) Consider, for example, how much detail we put into our wills, you know, and we're just apportioning one estate, not an entire land. The asterisk here is that the tribe of Levi did not receive a land allotment because, and here I'm quoting Joshua chapter 13, verse 33, the Lord God of Israel himself was their inheritance. So instead of tending land, the Levites tended the systems that facilitated Israel's worship of Yahweh according to the law, and thereby experienced the Lord's presence in a profoundly unique way. The rest of Israel gave tithes to the Levites to make all this possible, since they didn't have a land allotment. Plus, the Lord commanded the other tribes to give the Levites cities, totaling 48, and pasture lands so the Levites could have places to live and maintain some livestock. Knowing all of this, verse 5 feels awfully Levitical. Does it not? The psalmist declares that the Lord himself is his portion and therefore holds his lot. And accordingly, verse 6, the lot lines of what belonged to the psalmist have fallen for him in pleasant places. And indeed he has not just an inheritance, a beautiful inheritance. Do you see the second strategy now for dealing with discontentment? Number one, we could frenetically run after other gods. We could do that. Or number two, we can remind ourselves, we can remind ourselves that the Lord It's our portion and our inheritance. We can remind ourselves that we have the Lord right now and we will have the Lord forever. And so we will always have exactly what we need. And check this out. This is kind of where this whole thing has been going. The Lord who allocated lots to the Israelites with the wisdom and the precision of an elite surgeon. That is the same Lord who uses the same wisdom in precision to allocate the circumstances of our lives. You see how this starts preaching and why we shouldn't skip it? Folks making their way through the back half of Joshua and their read through the Bible plan, again, they often lose some steam. These lists start to be so, so much. They go on and on and on, but here's one way those lists can genuinely nourish our souls. As you read them, consider that God's care and provision for you right now is every bit as thoughtful and providential as his care for the Israelites after they conquered Canaan. You may not love your circumstances. You may even hate them on some level for being emotionally honest. But remember that regardless, God himself remains your portion at all times. And our circumstances are not random or thoughtless. They're not vindictive. They're none of that for the people of God. In fact, some of the most difficult lots in this life are apportioned to some of the most faithful people. People like Richard Williams I tell you, easy answers to this are impossible to come by. But we can be certain that hard circumstances need not mean that God has somehow withdrawn his favor. I've been thinking and talking a lot recently about, you know, how do you deal with, like, tragedy and loss? And one of the things I like to say is I do not look for whys 
to explain tragedies. All kinds of wonderful things happened in the wake of my dad's passing. But let me tell you, I'd rather have my dad back, okay? Those whys aren't good enough for me. But here's what I do look for. I think faithful Christians, they don't look for whys, they look for evidence of God's presence. Not for whys, they look for evidence of God's presence. You can keep going when you detect that God is with you. Well, enjoying God as our portion looks something like verses 7 and 8. And notice that all of this transcends our circumstances, which again, I'm arguing is good news. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, and then I also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. This reminds us of some of the themes that, might, that come up in Psalm 1. If you're familiar with Psalm 1, you might detect some thematic overlap here. The psalmist is, is taking what he knows to be true about God, things that he has learned, such as by meditating on God's law, and now he's using all of that, and he's instructing himself. He's taking God's counsel, and he's preaching to himself. And part of the sermon went like this. This God, who is my portion, he is, he is present with me. That's what he is. He's at my right hand. And therefore, I won't be shaken. Doesn't matter what I feel like right now. This is reality. He's present with me. And therefore, I will not be shaken. Sometimes, I'm not saying that all of you do this, but I'm just saying that some of us, sometimes, if you are a dad, this is a hypothetical thing, but you give, this is, here's what you might do. You might give two of your kids popsicles because your third kid is at the grocery store with mom and you're trying to find a constructive way to pass the time. You might do that, but then when the third kid gets home, she will find out about the popsicles even though you gave the other two kids a speech powerful enough to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and of course, you won't have any more popsicles left because there were only two popsicles. And so what you do at that point is, you know, dad humor kicks in, which I didn't find this back in the day funny at all, but now it's hilarious. <laughs> so dad humor kicks in. You tell the third kid, I'm sorry, I don't have another popsicle. But hey, you get me. Psalm 16 can feel like that if your circumstances are painful. Which is exactly why the psalmist instructs himself about God and his presence. The only way that Psalm 16 works at all, I got to tell you, is if you really know this God and you're impressed with him. It only works if you believe that the dad here is so wonderful that everything else, even popsicles, is nothing in comparison to knowing and having him. That's the only way any of this works. And this is why the Apostle Paul famously wrote in Philippians chapter 4 that he had, he had learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And what is that secret? If you read elsewhere in Philippians, the secret is knowing Christ. And here's the key, not just knowing things about him intellectually, but really knowing Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was so, get this, he was so present with us that he became human and came to this very earth. This Christ for, who, for our sake, was made to be sin, even though he knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Christ who, when he ascended to the Father, sent us the Holy Spirit to be what? To be present with us, even today, yes. and to guarantee our heavenly inheritance as co-heirs with Jesus. When you know this Christ, when you know this Christ, not just things about him, but when you really know him, and when you know that his presence is with you, especially via the Spirit, 
then you can be content in all circumstances. And you don't have to be shaken. You don't have to be tossed into the spiritual blender even when you get really bad news. And notice I didn't say that you'll never have the blender experience again. And Jesus is still there for you, even if you do. But there's a knowledge of Christ. There is a knowledge of Christ that makes it possible to bear even the worst kinds of circumstances and news with genuine contentment. That is actually possible. I'm not here to scold if you're not experiencing it. I'm just saying this is possible for the people of God. Isn't that beautiful? Here's one of the primary ways that we can counsel ourselves toward contentment, even in the very dark nights. Recall that Christ is our portion. At all times, he is exactly what we need. He is our portion salvifically. In him, we become the righteousness of God so that when the Father looks at us, he sees Jesus. He's our portion eternally. Jesus has secured for us an eternity with God that will involve beauty and glory and goodness that surpasses human understanding. And he's our portion presently. One of the major benefits being what you might have heard about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And accordingly, we can be joyful and we can be blessed no matter what's going on around us, because Christ is our portion salvifically and eternally and presently, especially for weak people. If you're feeling really, really strong, then you might not need this this morning. But if you're feeling particularly weak, and how can we counsel one another? Because we're a spiritual community, we endure together. How do we counsel one another? Certainly we will use similar reminders Keeping in mind that sometimes, you know what? We just need to sit with people when the storms are really raging. We just need to be with them. But I want to I wanna add one more, though. Let's, let's show people how God is at work in them and present with them when people are in the tank. One of the most powerful yet commonly undiagnosed causes of our discontentment is actually overlooking evidence of God's work and presence in our lives. So when we see it and other people, can we please tell those people about what we're seeing? Especially hurting people. So we counsel ourselves, we counsel other people, especially by reminding them concerning God's work and presence in their lives. And then after all of the counseling, how should we respond? We give thanks and rejoice. We counsel ourselves. We counsel other people. And then how do we respond? We give thanks and we rejoice. Look at verses 9 and 11, which... Pastor Mike actually covered a few months ago in more detail, so I'm going to be brief here. Therefore, my heart is glad. Do you see this response? Therefore, my, glad, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So the idea here is that contentment, when we experience it, brings gladness, Greek side. And then we articulate that gladness through thanksgiving and rejoicing. And then when we articulate that gladness through thanksgiving and rejoicing, here's what happened. It actually fortifies our contentment even more. So it's important to ask ourselves, are we short-circuiting that cycle? Are we making it a habit to intentionally give thanks and rejoice? Is the Lord your portion, salvifically, eternally, presently? And I would say, 
especially those of you here this morning, I know statistically at least a good number of you are, are hurting, are struggling, are experiencing discontentment. The Lord is your portion. He is near to you. He loves you. I love you. The people here love you. Let us walk with you for your good, for the glory of God. Thanks for having me this morning. Let me pray for us. Lord, we are just really amazed, honestly, that, I mean, so amazed that we can find refuge in you, God. And even though the, these storms might affect us, they don't, they can't touch you. you. You are so sure that we can run to you, not to false gods, that we can run to you regardless of our circumstances and find real protection and joy and even contentment, even in the midst of very difficult circumstances. Father, we thank you that we are walking with a God who sent his son into this world. Um, and there he experienced unbelievably trying circumstances. And so we know that as we take refuge in you, Lord, you understand us, you know what we're going through, which gives us all the more confidence to approach you and to be with you and to trust you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen.